Hey guys, well, the sun's out today, I guess. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, anyways, uh, <laughs> I'm pale. God damn. Anyways, uh, we're going to watch What If the Byzantine Empire Survived by Alternate History Hub. Uh, this one, this one should be interesting. I'm curious as to what he thinks would happen. Uh, let's see here. Um, hmm, what do I think would have happened? I'm, I know, I, I've, I've thought of this question before, but never really in depth. I'm like, huh? Oh, what would change? A lot of things would have to change first in order for it to be a possibility. Uh, the Byzantine Empire was in decline for so long by uh, 1453. Now, part of that was due to the arrival of the Turkic conquerors in Anatolia. Um, and obviously the rise of Arabic empires in the Middle East brought up helped bring about their decline. Um, now they could have gotten lucky, lucky and maybe have gotten a, a good leader uh, that would help revive them. What I think essentially it would be though, I don't think it would be the Byzantine Empire as we picture it or, you know, like the, the, the large spanning Byzantine Empire, you know, the one that ruled the Middle East essentially for a lot for a long time what I think the Byzantine Empire actually would have turned into had it survived is it would just be pretty much modern-day Greece it would just have that Roman that more I guess direct Roman ancestorship to look forward to and then also there wouldn't be really much Islamic uh, I guess conflicts with the other religions in the region in the um Balkan region uh you know like in Bosnia, Serbia, etc like those places. I'm not sure which country which Balkan country is the more mu Muslim populated country. I know one of them is and that's brought about issues in the region. But um because I guess people, for some reason people care about what other religions people want to, you know, believe in, whatever. Anyways, we're not about to get preachy on that. <laughs> um, but I think it would have been a more orthodox stronghold. There wouldn't really have been, you know, that Islamic Sunni religion spreading into the Balkans. That's about as much as I can predict. Let's see what Alternate History Hub has to say. You all gave me suggestions for an alternate history scenario as a part of the Humankind What If Contest, a new upcoming strategy game. And so I felt no era was more fitting for this type of game than the Eastern Romans. In 1453, the Roman Empire came to an end. What we now call the Byzantines saw themselves as that continuation of Rome that- Yes, they were Eastern Romans and didn't call themselves Byzantines, but I'm calling them Byzantine for the sake of time. Makes sense. Lasted for That's a like, if if I ever call Eastern Rome Byzantine, it, it, they've essentially become interchangeable in our time. Um. So yeah, they're 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 interchangeable. Um. And yeah, partially do saves time. Uh. Yeah. No, they were Eastern Roman. Uh. But it isn't wrong to call them Byzantine. Uh, I can't remember, like, what the definition of Byzantine was. Um, it's just that they they were the the most, I guess, correct way to call them is Eastern Roman. So yeah, you know. If you want to be as correct, I guess, as possible, even though, to me, I don't care. Like, if, if you in the comments section call them Byzantines, I'm not going to correct you. I'm not going to say you're wrong. You're, I'm not going to think less of you because of that. You know, anyone that does, I feel like you're kind of just a, you're an elitist. And, uh, yeah, it's Eastern Roman, Byzantine, interchangeable, blah, blah, blah. Let's continue on. <laughs> 
for millennia and a half. But then it was gone. The Eastern Roman Empire had been fading in and out of relevancy for the last 300 years. Yep. So what if in an alternate timeline, the Eastern Roman Empire never collapsed? Not only simply surviving, but remaining a competent player past the 15th century. Oh, so we are changing history a lot. Not just saying survival, which is what I was leaning towards. But competent, as in a military power that is fairly influential. This is kind of a double whammy question. One where the Byzantine Empire survives and the Ottomans never exist. But I'm not gonna focus too much on the Ottomans. Oh, so, okay, so he's completely removing the Turkic conquerors out of the question. The point I was saying was the Turkic conquerors like stayed in Anatolia and the, uh, the, I don't remember, Isthmus Strait, is that what it's called? I don't know what the strait is called that separates today Western uh, European Istanbul from Anatolian Istanbul, that that river. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, I swear I know geography sometimes, but yeah, I, I was I was leaning more towards that, like Tur Turkic conquerors control Anatolia, while the Byzantines survive in Greece as that's an entire video by itself, and this video is long enough already. If I ever do talk about the Ottomans, think of that as a companion piece. If we want to imagine keeping the Byzantines in our mortal plane, we need to go back, even before the fall of 1453, centuries back to the start of the nomadic migrations by Central Asian Turks into Anatolia. How do they survive? Tell me. Technically, we could just say Constantinople never falls in 1453 and call it a day. <laughs> but look at those borders. That's no way to live. So no, I have to make yeah. it clear. What territory do the Byzantines still hold that are core to the empire not collapsing? Greece and Anatolia, with perhaps some territory in the Balkans for good measure. Anything post-Arab invasions, but pre-Turkic invasions. But Cody... If you want to be really thorough, why don't you just say the Arabs never invade and the Byzantines keep the Levant in North Africa? Because, Jimmy, the Arabs after their initial invasion kind of just stopped after the borders got settled. The Caliphates had their own pressing matters after the Islamic invasions ended, yeah. and their presence in the region didn't threaten the Byzantines like the Seljuks did. If the Eastern Romans can settle, then so can we. When imagining a scenario where the Byzantine Empire doesn't die, first we have to ask, well, what killed it? Turks are certainly a prominent factor in the later years, but pick your poison. We got Lombards, Hungarians, Normans, Iranians. Okay, I'll cut that. Oh, I thought it was going to keep also going. Slobs, Arabs, oh. <laughs> the two biggest factors, Crusaders and the Turks. Everyone wanted a bit of the empire, and its entire existence post 400s was a defensive war to stop that from happening. Even the Normans took over Sicily and came to try to sack Constantinople on occasion. Because why not? There may be two main factors. <laughs> hey man, wealthiest city on earth, so like, why not? That gotta be changed so the empire doesn't outright die. One, no Turkic migration in Anatolia. How this happens can be from multiple different changes. Perhaps Persia remains politically stable and isn't taken over by the Turks. Perhaps there is never a need to go south due to more favorable climate conditions in Central Asia. The main proponent of whether the Turks settle Anatolia is really up to whether the Turks are forced to migrate. Their movement in Anatolia was mainly because of how turbulent Central Asia had become, and this led to conflicts with the Romans. Winning one battle like Manzikert wouldn't have stopped such a large migration. And as soon as they came, eventually they would be so numerous that the Byzantines just wouldn't hold influence in Anatolia anymore. So the situation in... What's, what's really amazing about these migrations that occur throughout history, like we have, as we've covered in a previous video, I can't remember which one, the Great Migration that happened in Europe, uh, which is one of the attributing factors to the fall of Western Rome. Um, the, you know, the Visigoths, Franks, etc. Um, what, what's truly amazing about those is the sheer amount of people that actually migrate. Like, just, like, uh, I guess today, in the modern day, what, a couple years ago, there in the United States, there was a, a, a caravan 
or something of immigrants coming up from uh, central, more southern Central America region, and they are wanting to go up and live up in America. Now, obviously, some didn't, some settled in various other places. And what we thought in the news and stuff, what you heard is, it was like, what, maybe 1,500 people? Like, it was, at most, it was a couple thousand, I think, people in that caravan. These migrations are like tens of thousands, if not maybe even reaching into the six figures of people migrating and moving to a new place to live. That is, to me, that, that feels like pretty uh, incomprehensible. <laughs> In Central Asia would need to be better, so the Turks don't need to migrate. Now, I know this is flimsy and isn't the best excuse, but it's really the best chance the Byzantines would have at survival. <laughs> Two, no Fourth Crusade. This is pretty much assured if point one didn't happen, but I'll go into that in a bit. Both were the killing blows that it couldn't come back from. Especially you, Fourth Crusade. Yeah, that Fourth Crusade did screw him. In alternate 11th century Anatolia, the demographics of the region is a mix of Greeks in the west, Armenians in the east, and Kurds and Syrians in the south. Not much of an alternate land, as this is just Anatolia before the Seljuks. The Seljuks spread into Anatolia, kicking the Eastern Romans all the way back to Constantinople so fast that in desperation, the emperor called on the Pope in the West for aid. And in response, Pope Urban II declared a crusade to form an army that would march into Anatolia and take the land back. So, if one main facet for the Byzantines to continue to thrive is there is no Turkic migration. A side effect from this is there is never a reason for the Byzantine Emperor to call for help, and therefore the Crusades never actually happen. As much as the Crusades in the Middle East have stayed relevant in Western history, be it from old legends of knights in armor, it, wait, hold on, what was that? Western history, be it from old legends of knights in armor. That's. That's a take, all right. <laughs> it really isn't that relevant in global history. Yes, for a century or two, there were crusader states in the Levant, but these were undone after the Third Crusade. In many ways, they didn't change that much in the Middle East, be it socially or politically, for both sides. But in Europe, they certainly did. Pope Urban II calling for a holy war set a precedent, and this had side effects. Because while we often think of the Crusades going in the Holy Land, this wasn't the only theater. The Crusades formed many orders and factions, one of which was the Teutonic Knights and Livonian Order, who after the Crusades, you know, kind of failed, they had to go back to Europe. <laughs> the last patch of paganism in Europe resided on the Baltic Sea, and a crusade was called to Christianize the region by force. The Great Northern Crusades and the knights that had taken place in the war carved up the region and settled it as their own kingdom. The Teutonic Order took root in this land and grew. So one of the effects of the Turks never entering Anatolia is the Teutonic Order is never created, booted up to Northern Europe, and doesn't create the Kingdom of Prussia. A Germany centuries down the line, if it did want to unify, would unify under a state like Austria, or perhaps some alternate northern kingdom that was able to take the place of Prussia. But either way, Germany is not unified by a militarized state. That has a lot of ramifications, <laughs> but is not important to the Byzantines at hand. Oh, well, I love that random tangent. <laughs> that is a big ramification, that's an entirely other scenario that isn't that important to the Byzantines. But I like how, what's always fun about these what if scenarios is that at least when it comes to making these kinds of videos, what you, what you notice is as you're going along and writing them, theorizing, what you're realizing, you're coming across situations in which you're like, oh crap, this, this allows me to make a whole nother video. This, here's another video. Like he's already proposed like three different scenarios in which he can branch off and make different videos, and that's that's really cool. But a bunch of hypothesizing to occur. The main crusade the Byzantines care about is the fourth. 
going through the 12th and 14th centuries, there might be a chance for the Byzantines to slowly rebuild without both worrying about the Turks and worrying about their empire being split by the Latins. So it would remain not only alive, but a decisive competitor in not just the East, but the European world, alongside their rivals, the Holy Roman Empire and the Catholic world. It's often overlooked considering it's been 500 years, but while it was still alive, the Byzantines were rarely friendly to the Latin West, and vice versa. Well, the reason behind that would be is, obviously, the Byzantines viewed themselves, or well, were the descendants of Rome. And, well, who controlled Rome? The Pope. And, well, there was a schism in the church, and Eastern Rome is Orthodox. The West is Catholic. <laughs> there are definitely butting of heads to occur. During the times of Justinian, they had tried to retake Italy from the Lombards and other tribes, only for it to end in failure, and the crown of the Roman Emperor had been given to the Franks by the Pope, which was a slap in the face to a state that was still Roman. The continued resentment only grew over the centuries. When the Great Schism occurred, this chasm only became wider. Eventually, Greeks would purge Latins in the street of Constantinople, and Latins would force conversions of Orthodox churches in southern Italy. You know, one of the things I've always been more interested in is this Great Schism, but there's like, there isn't really any classes that teach it, you know? So it's like, if I want to learn more about this time period, I kind of got to go find it myself, and that's a lot of work, man. <laughs> you know, it's not my... Specialty. My specialty, as I've said countless times before, is late 800s England. I'm busy studying that. I, I, while I would like to study more about the Great Schism and, well, just Eastern Rome in general, I can't. <laughs> it was even so bad when the Fourth Crusade burned Constantinople to the ground, the church was horrified. But if you ask the average person, they would say the Greeks deserved it. Oh. This alternate Europe sees the tensions that were Yikes. growing between the Catholic West and Orthodox East before the Ottomans manifest into various conflicts and competition, not unlike what the Protestants and Catholics had, transcending not just theology, but into secular politics and land grabs, as the Byzantines can actually enforce their claims, especially in Italy. Whether or not they would succeed to reclaim any of this land, perhaps southern Italy, I don't really know. This would be a running theme, as the western Latins proclaim they're the rightful heirs of Rome, and the Byzantines encroach at any opportunity to take back a land that they saw as rightfully theirs. Moving forward a few hundred years with the Mongols gone, the empire would soon find itself not alone in this competition with the west, because now we have the Russians. That historical fear in the west of the Russian horde morphs over the centuries as not just anti-Russian sentiment, but anti-Eastern. Mostly between the Holy Roman Empire, Austria, Hungary, and occasionally Russia or Poland joining in. Just as the Ottomans taking Vienna was a terrifying prospect for the Austrians, this doesn't change much just because it's the Byzantines. Say we continue on past the 15th century, and the struggle between the east and west has dominated European politics. Then suddenly, a monk in Germany nails a piece of paper to a door. Or someone else, considering how much of butterfly effect the Teutonic Order not existing and Byzantines continuing would have on this timeline. I can't imagine the Reformation would go detail for detail like in our timeline. More the general strokes. Many by this time did have problems with the church, and the inevitable invention of the printing press would spread local languages of the Bible. So Protestants, or at least Christians in the north, would rebel in the same form. The ramifications of this, however, would make the complexities and cluster truck that was the Reformation and Thirty Years' War even more of a mess. As now we also have an Orthodox state, technically two of them, already rivals to Latin Europe, taking advantage of the situation the church found themselves in. Europe during the Renaissance and Reformation is a wacky three-way battle between Protestants, Catholics, and Orthodox. 
I'd say it'd be less of a three-way battle and more everyone just teams up against the Catholics. Byzantines using this opportunity to move in on Austria and considering this is a timeline without Prussia Brandenburg, who knows who unites Germany? It's all up in the air. Medieval Empire in the Modern World. Oh, wow, really? The Ottomans were considered the sick man of Europe in the last 200 years of their life. And it wasn't really because of some major battle, it was because Europe, at least the West, just became far more wealthy. The ancient Silk Road routes across Asia were no longer needed. The Mediterranean, which was once the entire world, became just a small lake in the middle of a vast ocean. And slowly that prestige of their geographic position fell away, as nations naturally bordering the ocean flourished exploiting the new world in Asia. The Byzantines, despite existing since the time of Rome, would find themselves in the exact same position. Yeah. Became immediately devalued because of this, the caravel. It's true the Ottomans did block Europeans, except Venice, out of trade with China when they took power, encouraging the Iberian states to look for new routes to Asia. But this wasn't the only factor. The Iberian kingdoms, with the invention of the caravel, for the first time could navigate deep into the Atlantic Ocean. While the Ottomans did help with that little push, it's likely had the Byzantines still been around, the Portuguese would have gone down the African coast anyway, creating their own forts down the continent on their way to India, before one day being accidentally blown off course, landing on a continent that nobody knew existed. It may not be 1492 with Columbus finding the ocean blue, but news of another landmass across the sea has pretty much the same results that we saw in our timeline. The Spanish jump on board, then the British, Dutch, you get the point. The Byzantine prestige, whatever it had left, would dwindle down eventually. Be it colonization and the riches that it brings to its competitors, or the rise of nationalism that may strike in the following centuries. The state relied heavily on foreign mercenaries, and most decisions were top-down from the emperor. In a growingly complex world, this mentality would have to change, or the empire couldn't survive. The Byzantines, ironically, by a time of mercantilism and colonization, would be the sick man of Europe, and may be seen as an outdated relic of a bygone era. They might have to eventually reinvent themselves, and even if it wasn't as drastic as Turkey or China did, all empires do eventually come to an end. Whenever a nation or empire collapses far back in history, we often imagine that had it continued on, it would have remained the same type of entity that it was. The yeah, I, I agree with that statement. A lot of I mean, I'm, I, I think this way a lot as well. Uh, sometimes, you know, you just get caught up in it and you're like, oh, it would have, you know, it would have made it, it would have made it. Uh, but the Byzantines, I mean, they had already showed their long-lasting capabilities. I mean, they, Eastern Rome had lived for, after the fall of Rome, continued to survive for a, another, like, thousand years. You know, they last until 1453. Now, it, it can be argued, of course, that the entity that was Eastern Rome in 1453 probably does not deserve to be called an empire because of how tiny it was, but the government itself continued to last up until 1453, of course. So, I do believe it's not too hard to see them probably surviving just about probably as long as the Ottomans did. Now, would they have seen the same success in military? You can't really say. Um, can't really say if they would have gone on successful conquests like the Turkic conquerors did. That really all depends on who rules. Um, and Turkey had a great ruler in Mehmet II, the one that took Constantinople. Right, that was Mehmet II, right? I think I'm remembering him. I think I'm remembering my sultans correctly. But yeah. I think it would have probably evolved and shrunk into like the Balkan region uh, and just would probably become the modern state of Greece, you know? How soon maybe it would have changed to a, a Greek Republic? Who, who's to say? But I, I think 
I think they would have just slowly shrunk over time. I don't think they would have had like a violent collapse like uh, the Ottomans did. More remarkable and more or less keeping the same tradition alive for a thousand years. But compared to a world after Columbus, they would have to change. They would never reunite Rome, but they at least culturally would continue the tradition into the 16th and maybe 19th centuries until it's eventually reorganized as Greece, even if it's not by name. This is very much one of those butterfly type scenarios. Without Prussia, the dynamic of Eastern Europe is entirely shifted. The Baltics may become Orthodox instead of Catholic, or maybe Poland without the Prussians is able to become a superpower in its own right. Longer than Entirely our time. <laughs> alternate conflicts spawn houses and states that transform Europe in ways none of us can even predict, as they're based in history that simply never happened because the Byzantine, no, Roman Empire held firm. This is Cody of Alternate History Hub. Another great video by Alternate History Hub. I just love... I, I'm curious as to what his research style is for these kind of videos. I wonder if... Because... Like, there are times where when you're writing something that maybe you'll spend actually more time writing than you will researching. You know, that that's a, that's a thing that happens. It, it, I wonder what the average is for alternate history up to, for how many how long he spends researching and then how long he spends writing i feel like personally i would probably spend more time having fun writing and hypo hypothesizing what would happen because essentially <laughs> you can write away anything just by saying oh i wouldn't have happened you, know, you can cheat a little with what if scenarios um but yeah it was a good video Hope you guys enjoyed. Remember to leave a suggestion down below as to what you'd like to see me react to next. Remember to hit that like button and subscribe for more. Thank you. Have a good day. <laughs>